Good day, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting of law amendments Monday, March 25th to order and welcome everybody that's here. Just a few quick housekeeping things. For those that don't have a seat, if they want, there is going to be a live feed over in the uh, media room over here if anybody wants to sit and listen. Um, but for those that aren't, you're welcome to stay and stand. Um, we unfortunately, the red room is being prepared for budget lockdown. So um, uh, just a few little housekeeping things. Lock up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just a, so uh, I just remind everybody to please turn their cell phones on, vibrate, and there's no photography allowed uh, in the during the proceedings, with the exception of the media. So today um, we'll start with introductions of our committee, Ms. LeBlanc. Good afternoon, Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Hello, I'm Claudia Chender, MLA for Dartmouth South. Good afternoon, I'm Tim Hallman, MLA for Dartmouth East. Hello, Tori Rushton, MLA for Cumberland South. Good afternoon, Keith Irving, MLA King South. Hi, Suzanne Lonis Croft, MLA Lunenburg. On a nice sunny afternoon, I'm Rafa Di Costanzo, I'm Lake, uh, MLA Clayton Park West. Good afternoon, everyone. Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. And I'm Gordon Wilson. I'll be your vice chair. I'm the chair actually today. So uh, MLA for Claire Digby. So we'll start with, um, we have four bills here that we'll do first. Uh, we have no representation from them. Um, Bill 103, the Justice of the Peace Act amended. Ms. Suzanne Lonis Croft. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that bill number 103 be referred back to the House without amendment. Any discussion? Ms. Chender. Um, I just want to draw the members' attention to the fact that there, in fact, was a submission, although we don't have a witness, yes. from the presiding justice of the peace and secretary of the presiding justice of the peace's association on yes. this bill. I don't think it, we don't need to discuss it now, but hopefully everyone will have a chance to read it. Well noted. No further discussion? Oh. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion's carried. Bill 103, Justice of the Peace Act amended, will be referred back to the House without amendments. Bill 105, the Judici Ju Judicature Act amended. Mr. Irvin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move that Bill number 105, the Judicature Act, be referred back to the House without amendment. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motions carried. Bill 105, the Judicar Act amended, will be referred back to the House without amendments. Bill 109, the Pension Benefits Act. Mr. Irvin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move that Bill number 109, the Pension Benefits Act, be referred back to the House without amendment. Mr. Hallman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one note. Uh, the House Leader for the Official Opposition, the member for Inverness, Mr. Alan McMaster, had requested a list of uh, the pensions affected. Um, we were wondering if we could get an update on the lists of pensions affected, uh, whether it may be at the end of the day or tomorrow morning. Okay, we'll, we'll put that request in, I believe, maybe through our legal people. He's making a note of that, yes. duly noted. No further discussion. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion carried. Bill 109, the Pension Benefits Act amended, will be referred back to the House without amendments. Bill 112, the Education Act amended. Ms. D. Costanzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I move that Bill 112, uh, Education Act, to be referred back to the House without amendment. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion carried. Uh, Bill 112, the Education Act amended, will be referred back to the House without amendments. So now we have representation on Bill 116, the Biodiversity Act. Um, our first presenters are Debbie Reeves and Darcy Merriweather. If you would like to come forward and grab a seat. Welcome. So we're, <clears throat> we're fairly... Um, fluid here, but what we do is we allow 10 minutes for a presentation, excuse me, and five minutes for questions. I will keep uh, a, a timer here for you, and I'll give you a, a two minute left on the 10 minute if you want, uh, try and catch your attention. And if you have handouts, the page will grab those and pass those around for us. So the floor is yours, and welcome. 
You're on the clock. That's this is mine. Oh, sorry. That's, That's yours. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> do I have to turn the? You don't have to press anything. All you need to do is talk, Miss Reeves. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get the hang of this. My name is Debbie Reeves, and I'm coming before the committee to represent as a large private landowner in Lunenburg County, Nova Scotia. As a private woodlot owner, I support biodiversity as part of my good forest management. My management must include economic returns and a balanced approach to forestry practices and harvesting while working to take into consideration ecological aspects of my plan, including biodiversity. In Bill 116, Biodiversity Act, the only mention of private is private sector in paragraph six of the where is is introduction. Nowhere in the act is there mention of private woodland owners. We are and should be distinguished from other landowners as we play a different role in the sustainable use of our land for economic benefit as well as contributing to ecological goods and services, i.e. biodiversity. This act is overreaching and everything is biodiversity. This could result in unintended consequences, such as even stopping us from cutting dying fir trees as they could provide habitat for some types of bugs, or stop Christmas tree growers from planting genetic modified seedlings. Darcy Merriweather, who is appearing with me today, and myself, have been involved in meetings, workshops, consultations regarding biodiversity since the release of the report on biodiversity, the foundation for environmental, social, and economic prosperity in Nova Scotia, released February 2010. In section five of that report, one of the recommendations was to, I quote, develop incentives and remove impediments to conserving land and maintaining natural capital in recognition of the fact that taking privately owned land out of production to provide biodiversity may be good for the public, but may represent a cost to landowners. In the current act, the only mention of privately owned land is in section 12A with regard to biodiversity management zone. However, it does not include the critical component of compensation to the landowner. Few woodlot owners will e enter into agreements for management zone unless there is adequate compensation for the loss of their land for the period of time and there is future financial support to rehabilitate the land at the end of the agreement should the forest tree species suffer undue damage as a result of the lack of management over the course of the agreement. This would be unfortunate as we have the knowledge and understanding of the applied science of forestry to enhance, improve, and encourage biodiversity while at the same time still receiving economic benefits from our woodlots. The Government of Canada in their Canadian Biodiversity Strategy, Section 1D, Sustainable Use of Biological Resources, recognized that forestry companies and woodlot owners are important to assist with forest biodiversity. Strategic Directive 1.65, assess current and proposed major government forest policies and programs to ensure that ecological, economic, social, and cultural objectives have been considered. In the Nova Scotia Act 116, the importance of woodlot owners who own 70% of the forested land base and support for them including economic supports to assist in the promotion of biodiversity is omitted. It seems obvious that the committee and the writers of this act did not have a full understanding of the complexities of private woodland ownership and that a need for a balanced approach to protect the economic livelihoods of woodland owners in this province and the contribution they make to their royal communities has to be a critical part of this act. In this act, this min the minister is given extreme powers that may be exercised to protect biodiversity and pose penalties and fines that are at the point of extreme as compared to other acts. Although the current minister, Ian Rankin, has been quoted in the media saying this act will not be implemented on private land, there is no such assurances in this act. And without that assurance, 
we as woodlot owners will live in a very uncertain world, wondering when we will penalize for an unintended act or worse yet, a willful act by a trespasser which will be put our woodlots, our cells, and our families and our livelihoods in jeopardy. As part of the workshop leading to the formation of the committee and the writing of this act, we asked to be part of the review of the act in draft before it came to legislature. We were told that this review is not possible as it is not the policies and procedures for creating the act. At this point that the act has come to the House, I respectfully ask this committee to recommend that that very review by those woodlot owner stakeholders and sector before we get to a crossroads where the lives of 40,000 woodlot owners, their families, their employees, and the rural communities suffer undue consequences. I am sure the government did not intend to jeopardize woodlot owners and the omission of the protection of them and excluding them from the implementation of this act was an unintended omission. So now is the time to make sure the act reflects the intent, i.e. this act will not be enforced on private woodlot owners and moving forward there will be methods of funding to encourage their participation in formal biodiversity management zones under specific time periods and agreement of specific owners without peril to landowners who choose not to participate in the management zones. That's my submission, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We're open for questions. Mr. Rushton. Thank you guys very much uh, for showing up, and I, I appreciate that you don't, don't like public speaking. Uh, but I, I just want to throw this out to, out to you guys. I think it's written in there, but uh, you, you do not feel as the large woodlot owners that you guys have been consulted for this act. Um, to the proper extent that you get to review uh, and make recommendations of what should be in there? We absolutely were not. Thank you. Any other further questions? Thank you guys very much. Your, your comments are duly noted and will be, um, <clears throat> this goes forward to uh, Committee of the Whole House where I'm sure we'll hear further comments around that. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Next, we have Raymond Plourd of the Wilderness Coordinator for the Ecology Action Center. Welcome. So uh, again, uh, any seat at all, doesn't matter. Yeah. And uh, so you have, we have 10 minutes for a presentation and, and uh, Five minutes for questions. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On behalf of the Ecology Action Center, I'm pleased to appear before the Law Amendments Committee today in support of Bill 116, the Biodiversity Act. EEC is pleased to see the government introduce a Biodiversity Act for Nova Scotia and note with some pride that we are the first province or territory in the country to do so and one of the first jurisdictions in the world to do so. Um, it's, it's actually rare to see Nova Scotia do something before others do, and it's nice to see us taking a progressive lead. We hope that it will lead to much better conservation and stewardship outcomes on the ground to help arrest the precipitous decline in biodiversity that's occurring worldwide and certainly as well here in Nova Scotia. <clears throat> Together with the East Coast Environmental Law, we have researched this topic in some depth and we've held workshops with biodiversity conservation practitioners in Nova Scotia and have produced a report on what elements we feel should be included in an act to protect biodiversity, which we have submitted to the committee for your consideration. We are pleased to see many of the elements recommend, reflected rather in the legislation, but do feel that the act could be stronger and more ambitious in terms of specificity and the setting of goals and timelines, targets and timelines, sorry. We therefore submit the following recommendations for improvement to the bill, which we hope will be seen as friendly amendments to strengthen the act. In brief, we recommend Moving the bulk of the preamble section, the whereas is at the beginning of the act, uh, the draft act, into a purpose section, which is currently absent, in order to provide greater clarity of purpose and legal weight of the act. Two, committing to produce an initial state of biodiversity report within two years rather than five. Five seems overly long 
and two corresponds better with the current government's mandate and would ensure that focused attention is not lost over a prolonged period. Identify critical biodiversity areas and develop an integrated and coordinated biodiversity plan by 2021. Again, those two uh, corresponding with the current government's uh, mandate. Um, a short word on Clause 45. We strongly support it. It reads, no person affected by this act or the regulation is entitled <coughs> to compensation for any restriction, encumbrance or use or the lack of use of any nature or kind whatsoever that may result or results from the enactment of this act or the regulations. I think it's important to point out that biodiversity is the life support system upon which we all rely and it's the source of all of our natural wealth. Preserving it is therefore a shared societal responsibility and government's role is rightly to regulate and set appropriate limits. Although the benefits of biodiversity use flow unevenly, it is fair to say that most everyone benefits in some way and so everyone has an interest and a responsibility to ensuring the health of the ecosystem that supports it. This is doubly true of companies that extract significant wealth from biodiversity use. They must do their share as well, without expectation of compensation from the public purse. As primary beneficiaries of biodiversity use, they have a big incentive and a big responsibility to ensure the health of the ecosystems upon which they rely. Um, I would like to note as well that in Section 12, uh, subsection A, um, it is quite clear that the intention with regards to setting biodiversity uh, zones or management zones um, is to be done on crown land and only to be done on private land with the consent of the landowner. This was made very explicit in the uh, uh, debate, uh, second reading debate. Um, and so uh, private landowners should not feel uh, threatened by this. They would have to give their permission in order to have that uh, designation put on private lands. And on Crown lands, it is entirely appropriate for the government to set limits um, as it is owned by everyone. In conclusion, we are looking forward to working collaboratively with government in the implementation of the Act and the formation of its regulations and the processes that will flow from it. Fortunately, there is a knowledgeable and generous community of practitioners already working on biodiversity conservation in Nova Scotia that the province could engage with, and there are many ways Nova Scotians can help biodiversity every day. We are therefore also happy to hear the government will be looking at expanding the recently created Biodiversity Council to include a wider diversity of perspectives, knowledge, and expertise. I thank the committee for your time. Thank you very much for your presentation. We have time for questions. Ms. Chender. Thank you, Mr. Plourd, for your presentation, and I look forward to reading the longer submission. Um, I mean, you, you, you speak to it, but I'm curious about, I mean, I'm glad you drew our attention to Section 12, where, you know, a private landowner would need to consent before, mm -hmm. um, before this was an action on their land, but in terms of Clause 45, um, you know, that no person is entitled to compensation. Just to clarify, I think what you're saying is just sort of we all, we all derive benefit from the environment and therefore we are all responsible to be good stewards. Is there any additional reason why you think compensation shouldn't be provided when some, you know, a piece of land that potentially is financially profitable for someone is taken out of use? Is there anything else you could say? If it is that? crown land, certainly not. Sure, of course. Certainly not. Right. If it is private land, yes. then it would be something that could be perhaps um, considered in discussion to gain uh, a private landowner's consent. But this act makes it quite clear that it cannot happen on private land without consent. So right. what I'm pointing out there is that private landowners should not fear this act as something that will be imposed upon them. Right. But you wouldn't be opposed to that being part of a discussion in order to gain consent, hypothetically. 
I'm just Hypothetically, to I suppose the discussion, but I'm not favorably disposed to the notion of people pay, being paid to do the right thing when sure. it's the life support system that we all rely on, mm -hmm. and again is the source of all naturally derived wealth. Mm -hmm. um, if we are to take the um, a position that private land allows us to indiscriminately do anything, and including very potentially damaging uh, activities to uh, the ecosystem itself, and that is not in anyone's best interest. And so uh, I'm, I'm still largely uh, oriented towards saying that we all have a responsibility, so compensation mm -hmm. in the terms of finances to do the right thing is not something that I would generally support, but I think that there is room within this act for uh, government and private landowners to discuss um, what conditions might be acceptable to them in order to gain their um, uh, permission to have a biodiversity management zone that would include some or all of their lands. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Next is Lisa Mitchell, Executive Director of East Coast Environmental Law. Welcome, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you. So again, the floor is yours. Ten minutes for questions, or ten minutes for presentation, and five for questions. And I'll do my best. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'll begin by <coughs> saying thank you. Thank you to uh, the members of the committee for giving us this opportunity to be here today. Thank you to Minister Ian Rankin for introducing this piece of legislation, and to the members of the legislature for getting it to this point. Um, the East Coast Environmental Law Association is a public interest environmental law charity, and we were established in 2007. We're based in Halifax. Our office is on the campus of Dalhousie University. And we advocate for the fair application and innovative and effect, uh, fair, sorry, fair application of innovative and effective environmental laws in Atlantic Canada through education, collaboration, and legal action. In 2017, we welcome the commitment of government to create a Provincial Biodiversity Act as the first law of its kind in Canada, and one of only a handful around the world. We saw this as a unique and an important opportunity. Since attending the Department of Lands and Forestry Information Session back in January of 2018, we have worked with the Ecology Action Center, and Ray Plord was uh, just speaking with you, to conduct research and outreach to contribute to the creation of a good biodiversity act for Nova Scotia. This included a jurisdictional review and legal analysis of similar legislation around the world, and three Biodiversity Act conversations that included uh, representatives from uh, legal experts and conservation practitioner, practitioners to gain information and expertise. Through this, we developed the overview and list of key recommendations that Ray uh, mentioned and that you have a copy of. We did anticipate that there would be public or stakeholder engagement process to be led by the department prior to the introduction of the bill. However, uh, and it appears we're not alone in this, when it became clear that consultation would not take place, we shared our full report and the key recommendations with the department. We made the information available to the public as well through our websites. The fact of the Biodiversity Act, in our opinion, is very positive. The process of engagement that got us here was not the best, and there's still a lot of work left to be done. So it's with that background that I appear before you today. In our review of Bill Number 116, I see a number of things. A strong preamble, but a weak purpose section. A long list of ministerial powers that show great promise, but a very short list of ministerial duties. An incredibly robust enforcement program. Uh, but little opportunity for engagement. How the Biodiversity Act will facilitate conservation, sustainable use, and equitable sharing of resources appears to rest primarily with the regulations. As Minister Ian Rankin stated in his well-informed presentation to the legislature on March 15, and I quote, to complete the toolkit, regulations supporting this new Biodiversity Act will de be developed through consultations with the Mi'kmaq, conservation partners, and all Nova Scotians. As a public interest organization that specializes in environmental law, we do look forward to participating in these consultations to better position the government and the public for the building of those important regulations and to more fully articulate the purpose of a Biodiversity Act 
East Coast Environmental Law recommends the following five amendments to Bill 116. The first amendment, which looks really long, <laughs> but isn't actually, um, Ray Plort actually alluded to this as well in his presentation. Uh, it is about moving from a preamble to a purpose section with principles. Uh, a purpose section provides vision and guidance to the public, regulators, and the judiciary on the intent of an act. The key environmental laws in Nova Scotia, including the Nova Scotia Environment Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act, all include a robust pur purpose section with goals or principles. None of these statutes include a preamble. Uh, our recommendation is that there be an amendment such that basically most of the preambular statements become principles uh, through the purpose section. So the purpose section would remain as it is, but these principles would be added as subsection two, or section two sub two, basically, uh, saying the act is based on the following principles, and then uh, you can see in my uh, written submission specifically. I haven't changed any of the wording of the actual uh, preamble statements that are there. Our second amendment, uh, that we're recommending relates to goals and targets. And I will draw your attention, if I can, uh, to section 7 sub H. The provisions on ministerial powers and duties are extensive in the bill, covering sections 6 to 14. Within these, based on my count, there are 37 powers and three duties. We recommend just one more duty. Uh, setting goals and targets is not only at the core of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which Canada was the first to sign in 1992 at the UN Conference of Environment and Development, but it's the primary means of moving toward improving our understanding about biodiversity and ultimately creating sustainable, workable solutions. So we've simply suggested that that particular may be changed to a shell. I haven't asked for a timeline, although I certainly support the timeline uh, that my colleague Ray has indicated. Uh, we haven't asked for a timeline, but moving it from a may to a shell. The minister shall establish or adopt goals and targets for biodiversity and indicators, et cetera. Amendment number three is around sharing of information. And you'll see that my final three amendments are all about engagement and sharing information. Uh, and I draw your attention here to subsection, or sorry, section 14, subsection one of the bill. The bill commits the minister to sharing data relating to biodiversity. We recommend that the duty be slightly extended to include access to other information that may, may be gathered under the act or relating to the act. The particulars of what would be shared uh, would be addressed in the regulations. So again, not asking for specific information to be shared. Um, as you may be familiar, many environmental statutes, including the Environment Act, uh, have an, a, a registry, public registry or an environmental registry that contains a lot of information. Uh, I think such a, a registry would be wonderful for an act like this. I would leave it to the minister's discretion to what that would look like and only ask that there be an extension to the duty to share information beyond simply biodiversity data. Number four relates to the state of biodiversity reporting, and uh, that is section 14 sub two. Encouraging research and information sharing is an important priority in the area of biodiversity, and we are very pleased to see the commitment to a state of biodiversity report. Five years, however, puts us long past the mandate of the current government, if we think about this, we don't anticipate that this act will be proclaimed for probably a year. So we're talking about the first Biodiversity Act in 2025. I think that's too long. I'm going to recommend that two years for the first State of the Biodiversity Report uh, be an appropriate time frame. Also keeping in mind that there is nothing here that prevents the minister from defining a bio State of the Biodiversity Report in regulation. It could be a particular aspect of biodiversity one year and another aspect another year, but that there is some commitment within a two-year time frame to provide something uh, to the public on biodiversity. My final 
uh, suggested amendment is uh, a whole new one. Not an amendment, I guess, it's a, a new provision. And I suggest it could be section 47 at the end of the act. Uh, and this is to do with public review of regulations. The minister and the department have both made public commitments to engage on the development of regulations. We applaud this. And we see it as a value to both the department and to the public. We recommend that this commitment be reflected in the act as it is in section 26 of the Nova Scotia Environment Act. So that provision that I've included, which says any new regulations or any substantive amendment to the regulation becomes law only after the regulations or amendments, as the case may be, have been subjected to such public review as the minister considers appropriate. So again, not telling the minister how to do it, but having a commitment, commitment that they've made publicly um, in, the, in the act itself that there would be a review of all the regulations. And that concludes my comments. Thank you. Questions? Ms. Gender? Well, I just want to thank you for coming. This is really thorough and very, very helpful. Um, in terms of the consultation, you know, you mentioned at the outset and, and other presenters have mentioned that the consultation process was not as, as many would have wished leading up to this bill. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that when that became apparent, you submitted this. Mm -hmm. How did it become apparent to you that you are not going to be consulted? We, that we learned that a bill that the probably bill was going to come forward. Yeah, in this session. And, and had you attempted to contact the department? We'd been in contact with the department off and on. But yeah, you not, in, not in meetings, but right. yeah, prior to that. Yeah. Uh, and, and did you have an expectation that there would be consultation? We asked for consultation okay. in the information session. <coughs> yeah. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. Uh, for, oh, further to my <coughs> colleague's question, uh, when you made your submission, when you know, in this in this time when you realized you wouldn't be consulted, do you, do you see your submissions reflected at all in the act? Um, like, or is this kind of what you were, is this that you've just t told us today, is that kind of this, the same, uh, some of the, the same things, subject or the yeah, same content that you Some of the things for? are definitely reflected in, in the bill. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Great. Very nice presentation, by Thank the way. Thank you. Andrew Fedora, board member for Force Nova Scotia. Andrew, welcome. So any one of those seats, and if you have folks that you'd like to have with you, certainly. And maybe what I'll do is get them to introduce themselves also, just in case there's questions. Or you can introduce them for, for us. Uh, <laughs> How'd that be? Sure, I don't, I don't mind doing that at all. And uh, right off the bat, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we're we're very, uh, very pleased to be here to address the committee today. And so uh, to my immediate right, I have uh, Steve Masters, who's a woodlot owner and who has been working in various aspects of forestry for quite a few years. And to his right, we have Ian McKay. Which, uh, he's with uh, JDI, or Irving Limited uh, for Nova Scotia. <coughs> and as mentioned, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Board of Directors for Forest Nova Scotia today. <coughs> Forest Nova Scotia is the largest organization of forestry interests in Nova Scotia, with a membership of over 600 members, of which 85% are private landowners. In addition, we speak today with the support of the Canadian Association of Forest Owners, who work together with 450,000 individual families, farmers, uh, and companies, and associations across Canada who own forested land. And I believe a, a letter of their support was included in our package as well. The land mass of Nova Scotia is predominantly forest land, with approximately 65% of this forest land being privately owned by over 30,000 different landowners. Our members value biodiversity and make great efforts to protect biodiversity. So we must be clear that we have no concerns with this act as it defines broad brush, or sorry, we must be clear that we have concerns with this act as it defines broad brush ministerial, ministerial authority, broad consultation rights, extensive punitive penalties, and no regulations yet defined. So our concern is not with protecting biodiversity in Nova Scotia. It has much more to do with, with the authority that this act seems to create. Our membership is highly concerned this exposes our rights as private landowners. 
So we will review some specific points that will, clarif uh, will clearly explain our concerns that we wish to have addressed and stress to you, the MLAs on this committee, that we urge you to listen to these concerns as they are the concerns of private landowners in the very towns, villages, and counties each of you represent. Bill 116 has moved to this committee very rapidly since the first reading. And now that the act is available for our members, we have not been granted much time to communicate and engage our membership on its intent. Mm -hmm. So you've heard this from some of the other presenters. I think there are some, some common themes here and concerns. This act allows the minister to designate any crown land as a biodiversity management zone. To do the same with private lands requires the consent of the landowner. As we are representing private landowners today, we would like to make a few points to clarify some concerns we have regarding our rights as private landowners. So the first point, the act gives the minister broad authority to implement activities, policies, and programs for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. However, it is unclear whether any such requirements apply solely to lands designated uh, as biodiversity management zones or to all lands in the province. So within the act, the definition of land is all lands including water. So the implications there or the unclarity is do, does this apply to private land? We simply don't know. We haven't had enough chance to look at that. If you look at land as a whole and biodiversity as a whole, this transcends forestry interests or private landowner interests in terms of small private woodlot owners, which I'm, I'm, I'm more accustomed to dealing with. Um, what about farmers? What about developers? What about fishermen? What about Aboriginal communities? How much authority is the minister going to have um, over these and how many acts will this you know, supersede? So if it is the latter, indeed, for example, if, if this does include all land, it would impact management and decision making for private lands even if the landowner does not consent to a land designation as a biodiversity management zone. Our second point, section 31 details a broad range of prohibitive activity that is contrary to biodiversity. But again, it appears that this applies to activities on all lands, crown and private, not just lands designated as a biodiversity management zone. This threatens the livelihood and the rights of private landowners who should have a choice in what happens on their lands. Point three. Section 45 <laughs> states that any affected parties are not entitled to compensation for loss or costs arising from implementation of this act. This is not consistent with other legislation, for example, the Endangered Species Act. There should be overriding language to clarify this conflict between this act and other legislation so it is clear which act will indeed govern Nova Scotians. It should be clear to landowners if this act gives power to the minister to expropriate or restrict private land without compensation or not. It is currently unclear. Point four, we also have major concern with government partnering with, quote, any person, as outlined in section eight, to investigate and enforce the act. Our membership strongly disagrees with this as we are a stakeholder in the outcome of this act. The government partnering that provides consultation, research, and advising the minister in binding regulations needs to be more defined and not so broadly powered as currently defined. Point five, the penalties for offenses have high thresholds when compared to other acts for both corporations and private landowners. Uh, so as for, for reference, up to $500,000 dollars for the first offense and a million dollars for the second offense if you're private landowners. Which is interesting if this doesn't affect private landowners, why would you have that allocation in there? Up to one million for the first offense and two million for the second offense of corporations. This is compared to similar penalties under Endangered Species Act, which are up to a million. But then there's the Forest Act, which is up to $100,000, and the Wildlife Act is between $2,000 and $5,000. This act has high stakes with its regulations yet to be developed. The punitive exposure with unknown regulations is a major concern for our membership and for the Canadian Association of Forest Owners. So in closing, 
As we have said, our organizations fully support sustaining biodiversity for all Nova Scotians. As landowners, we manage land for our livelihoods with a long-term sustainable view. Access to our own resources is a fundamental right to the livelihood of rural Nova Scotia. We caution this committee that we feel the language defined in this act is vague and incomplete. The ministerial power given in this act is all encompassing and due to its broad, unclear scope, we are going to lose our rights and livelihoods to work and manage our lands. We recommend and will provide language clarification on the points we have brought forward and caution this committee to take more time to prevent unintended consequences of approving this act as written today. A carefully measured act and subsequent regulation that does not overreach is required. And that's what I have, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fedora. So any questions from the committee? Ms. Chender? Um, thank you very much for your presentation for coming today. I feel like I've, I see some amalgam of you guys at this table quite often <laughs> in different settings. Um, your point five, I don't see a place in the act where a private landowner is liable. I see reference in section 37-1-A-I to the case of an individual or a corporation. Can you point me to the place in the act where a private landowner is liable? I do not have that information in front of me right now. This was based on the advice that we received from our solicitors. Okay, because I don't, what I see in the act, and, and I, I'm happy to be corrected mm -hmm. if, if your solicitor does come back, mm -hmm. but what I see in the offenses and penalties is that there are offenses for individuals and for corporations. And so I would read that just right now off the page as mm -hmm. an individual who contravenes a biodiversity zone on Crown land or a corporation who contravenes that on Crown land. With so I'd be interested if you have a different interpretation of that. With respect to the definition of an individual. Just one minute oh, and the enhancer will recognize you. Sorry about on. that, Mr. <laughs> McKay. There you go. Um, within def def the definition of an individual could qualify for a private woodlot owner. So if they were you know, doing activity on their woodlot, they qualify as being an individual. Yes, but, but, my under but, but to me that sort of strains the intent and and the act as it's written because because what I see here is a very clear section 12 that says a, that a private woodlot owner has to give consent for a biodiversity zone on theirs and so I think this section refers and it'd be interesting to get advice on this to activity in biodiversity zones on crown land so yes if a private woodlot owner went on to crown land and contravened this act then sure as an individual but but I I don't think it I don't read it as applying to a private woodlot owner on their own land because I don't think this act applies to that without consent. So I was just curious if you have a different understanding of that or, and like I say, if, if you get a different opinion on that and want to submit it after to us, I, I'd, I'd be interested to see it. I just, I, I didn't understand that point. Thank you. Thank you. It speaks to the point that um, we feel there is a certain amount of unclarity within this act. Mr. McGuire. Thank you. Thank you for being here today and, and further my um, colleague's point. Um, I look at this as, you know, in, in the community that I live, a pro private company had trespassed onto Crown land mm -hmm. and had gravely impacted uh, the biodiversity of a public park. Mm -hmm. And we were very limited on what we could do. Mm -hmm. So when, when I heard that part of the act, I thought, okay, maybe this strengthens the penalties or uh, um, prevents those companies from doing that because at the time, you know, our community saw, I mean, it was acres and acres of land that was cut down in a, in a, on Crown land in a, mm -hmm. in a uh, provincial forest mm -hmm. uh, that bordered private land. Um, and, you know, there was, when, when the inspectors went in there, it was pretty apparent that there was, there was, uh, you know, more than just cutting, there was dumping and things like that. So that's how I see it. But also, if there are some questions around this, like this will be up for third reading, and maybe these are things that we can ask the minister to clear, because obviously we want to make sure that uh, there is a protection of the biodiversity, but at the same time we support the private woodlot owners mm -hmm. to ensure that, you know, we're not cutting your feet out from underneath you too. So right, right. Uh, we will we'll have conversations around this in third reading, and then maybe we can clear up some of the stuff. Sure, I, I certainly appreciate that. And, and, and to be clear, you know, one of the, one of the, the strong themes uh, with respect to that and our concerns is unintended consequences. Right. 
So people who are clearly doing things that they shouldn't be doing, right. and uh, people who clearly should be fined, that's not necessarily a concern. But in, in the lack of um, clarity both within the Act and the potential regulation, combined with um, what we see as very authoritative uh, power, uh, very strong power from the minister, it, it, it's, we're concerned. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate Thank you. it. Appreciate your time. Next is uh, Sarah Kingsbury, I believe a research student from St. Mary's University in environmental and social degrees. So welcome, Sarah. Uh, you have uh, somebody accompanying with you also, so you can introduce them if you'd like. And the floor is yours, 10 minutes for a presentation and five for questions. First off, thank you so much for allowing me to be here today and to present to you. Um, this is my research supervisor, Dr. Linda Campbell, and she's here with me today to support my presentation. Uh, like you have said, I am a graduate student at St. Mary's University and I study aquatic invasive species. I'm so pleased to get the opportunity to discuss Bill 116 with you. I think the province has taken a very positive step forward in creating a Biodiversity Act, but I think we need to be mindful in the way that things are worded and how the act is implemented. Today I want to talk to you about invasive species. Invasive species are a serious threat to biodiversity, and that is why I feel the Bill 116 has only one line for invasive species under Section 46, Subpara Oscar. It reads, the governor and council may make regu regulations respecting the prevention and management of invasive or alien species. This line alone may not be sufficient. Who knows what this is? This is a Chinese mystery snail shell. You may have seen it around in the lakes in Nova Scotia. You could have walked by the shell a thousand times and never have known that it's aquatic invasive species. This snail has entered Nova Scotian waters without anyone being aware of the potential risks it poses. The snails likely continue to spread throughout Nova Scotia through illegal aquarium dumpings and through accidental boater transfers. The extent and impact of the snail still remains unknown. My thesis project is based upon creating a computer model that merges together habitat suitability modeling public education, reports of Chinese mystery snail occurrence from helpful citizens, and lake surveys to predict, where Nova, to predict where the Chinese mystery snail has become established throughout the Maritimes. Chinese mystery snails are not the only undetected invasive species that has entered Nova Scotia. This is happening with many invasive species, both aquatic and terrestrial, that are not being monitored for the potential harmful impacts. Invasive species are considered the second greatest threat to, endanger, to species endangerment and extinction. Department of Fisheries and Oceans, thank you, Canada, defines aquatic invasive species as non-indigenous species that threaten natural, natural biodiversity through competition, predation, degradation of natural habitat, and destruction of invaded ecosystems. Invasive species can also present financial uh, implications. Aquatic invasive species have been estimated to have 128 billion to 131 billion US dollar negative impact on the US economy annually. So how do we prevent the spread and introduction of invasive species? First of all, Nova Scotia needs to establish and support a native species network to monitor the threat of, of potential and current inv invasive species. There are already excellent monitoring programs in other provinces and states which we can look at. We can use the information in other areas to develop predictive models and risk assessments. Also, the Invasive Species Network could look for potential and existing invasive species and continue to monitor and search for them. Secondly, education is very important. Nova Scotians need to be aware of the risk presented with invasive species, how to identify the most important ones, and how to prevent the spread of further species. Let's use the Chinese mystery snail as a case study. This snail first entered 
North America in 1890 via the Asian food market and since has spread across North America. It's been documented in Canada, in British Columbia, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador. Without monitoring, we don't have any idea which lakes and systems have become impacted by the snail species. This snail, as you can see, is at least twice as large as our largest native species. And female Chinese mystery snails can have over 100 offspring per year. So it takes only one fertile female to establish a population of Chinese mystery snails. Once an invasive species invades an uninvaded ecosystem, they can experience a population boom, which leads to native species becoming displaced. Chinese mystery snails can also alter the microbial and algal communities, which are important for the health of our fresh waters. Mystery snails can also alter the nitrogen and phosphorus water concentrations, which may be leading to toxic algal blooms in our lakes. Again, the Chinese mystery snail is but one of the examples of invasive species. Nova Scotia has dozens of invasive species, and most are not being adequately monitored. Without the proper funding, monitoring programs, public education programs, and governmental regulation oversight, Nova Scotia will continue to be a hot spot for invasives. Currently, our situation is poor. There is no consistent source of training, funding, or education that we can point to and say, this is for invasive species research or for monitoring the, th the threat and spread of invasive species. The funding that exists now is often tied to rare or endangered species, but waiting for an invasive species to negatively impact one that's already rare or endangered can often come as too little too late. Nova Scotia needs a more robust definition and mandate for action. That is why I'd like to ask that Bill 116 be amended to specifically expand on the definition of aquatic and terrestrial invasive species and to include a statement on the urgency for oversight and monitoring programs to be established and to support education, monitoring, and research programs to assess the threats and impacts of invasive species in our beautiful province. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could we have our page uh, make a copy of your presentation for the committee members while you're here? Of course. Thank you. Uh, open the floor to questions. Ms. LeBlanc. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I find that so interesting. And it, I guess I have two questions. Um, uh, one, I mean, it feels like your points are so uh, important that, I mean, do you see that that your um, that the that the pr protection against invasion invasive species fits in this act like is this the act <coughs> for it or or is it a big enough thing that we need a whole other piece of legislation around it because it, it feels like it's a huge part of uh, of protecting our bio biodiversity what what do you say to that it is a large portion of biodiversity and it touches on so much that is already in the act that including a portion that emphasizes the importance and especially providing those definitions for what invasive species are and providing further funding for the research needed and the management needed would go a long way already. Okay. Um, I've been working with people in my own constituency about a, 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 a plant in cold water lakes, or I mean freshwater lakes, uh, they're very cold, um, <laughs> called the floating yellow heart, yes. um, which is a big, big issue. And mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that we want to protect against is for that to spread to our, um, our um, recreational lakes like Lake Bannock mm -hmm. and, um, and Lake Micmac. And so I'm wondering what you see as the government's role in terms of something like that that's an existing problem. Uh, what would you want the government to do to, to help prevent the spread of that and, and to eradicate it? A lot of issues with invasive species have to deal around with public education. The public's not aware enough invasive, of invasive species, which ones are invasive, which ones aren't, and so they accidentally sometimes transfer them between lakes. That also goes with um, educating boaters because oftentimes things will come tangled in their equipment or in their motors and then they transfer between lakes without proper cleaning. So a lot of it is education and monitoring programs and also uh, some of the other provinces have um, 
uh, computer apps and phone apps where you can where you can um, submit uh, invasive species that you find, and so it helps the government track invasive mm -hmm. species through that. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. McGuire. I want to thank you for your presentation today, and it, it got me thinking as you were speaking with the uh, Chinese mystery s snail. Yes. Uh, that not all invasive species come from outside the country. A lot of the lakes, so I'm a recreational fisher, and you know we, we like to trout fish and stuff like that. And a lot of those lakes have been inundated with bass because smallmouth bass. some people want to fish smallmouth bass. And what we're seeing in particular in our community is a lot of the lakes that are filled with trout are no longer filled with trout as, as bass will take over. So there is a big part of this is educating people because now what we're starting to see is is people like myself who like to go out and, and fish trout are saying like where are all the trout, yes. right? And if somebody wouldn't have dumped bass in those lakes five years ago, yeah. we, we might not have this issue. So it is it's it is important, uh, and it's also important to let people know that just because a species comes species comes from Nova Scotia doesn't necessarily mean that it's in this pond or that pond. And that's so shouldn't. true, and that's why research is so important, especially with species that you know may become invasive in Nova Scotia. Uh, you need to assess the potential risk before it's brought in. Thank you very much. Ms. Chender. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your presentation. As my colleague <clears throat> mentioned, um, this is key of keen interest to us in Dartmouth, throughout Dartmouth, um, because we're the city of lakes, um, yes. and our lakes are really stressed. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the big challenges we have is that there <laughs> seems to be a kind of quiet policy that the provincial government doesn't really deal with urban lakes. Um, and the idea, I suppose, being that a lot of those lakes, you know, challenges we would find in those lakes would be sort of have an ur originate in some kind of urban activity and therefore be more in the purview of the municipality. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and it feels like with the floating yellow heart um, in Dartmouth North, uh, with the blue green algae that we have in Lake Banook, with yes. the rapid weed growth that we have in other lakes, mm -hmm. it impacts biodiversity. Um, but it also has a potentially really large economic impact on our communities because, yes. as as my colleague said, you know these are recreational lakes, and particularly the Shuby chain of lakes, there's really a price tag attached because we do have so many co international competitions on those lakes. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question is, do you um, do you see that as appropriate? Do you think that the provincial government has a role to play in protecting urban lakes, or do you think that's best left to the municipality? I think. Uh, both could be true. Mm -hmm. The province definitely does need to play a stronger role, um, definitely in the public education, the funding. For example, um, right now a lot of emphasis is put on rare species. So if you look at the key goals for the Nova Scotia Museum of Natural History, they're focused on creating content around rare species. Mm -hmm. So the provincial government plays a role in shifting the discussion more towards invasive species as well. Mm. Thank but you. they need to work with municipalities, definitely. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, encouraging and refreshing to have, um, have young students, research students especially, here before us. I just have to note to you, too, I, I, I don't know if you're aware, but you can download uh, on YouTube. This uh, is being streamed and it is available um, if that helps in your evaluation of your course and you certainly should be getting an A+. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, her yeah. yeah, that's why I made the plug. Yeah. <laughs> no, very well done. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mike Lancaster, St. Mar Margaret's Bay Stewardship Association. Mr. Lancaster, welcome. So uh, we do, I don't know if I, if I just recognize you in the crowd there if you just came in or not, did, but yeah. we, we do, we do uh, 10 minutes for presentation and then five minutes for questions. We're, we're uh, well, well on, on schedule we are here. So uh, it's, uh, as you can see, it's sort of a good relaxed back and forth for conversation and questions. So the floor is yours. Sure, great. 
Uh, so I, I did miss the earlier proceedings. I think we're actually ahead of schedule. I was told that I was going to be on at 4.15, so that's why I'm a little rushed now. <coughs> uh, so as mentioned before, I'm with the St. Margaret's Bay Stewardship Association. I'm the stewardship coordinator. I'm also here representing the Woodens River Watershed Environment Organization, for whom I'm also the stewardship coordinator. On behalf of the St. Margaret's Bay Stewardship Association and Woodens River Watershed Environment Organization, we are grateful for the opportunity to appear before the Law Amendments Committee this afternoon. We are pleased to see the government introduce an act that aims to protect and enshrine the protection of biodiversity into legislation. Uh, so I'm going to refer to the associations and their acronyms here a little bit. Both the Stewardship Association and RIO, that's W-R-W-E-O with silent W's, uh, work hard to protect, uh, work hard for the protection of biodiversity, oops, sorry, work work hard to ensure the ecological integrity of our catchment areas and endorse Bill 116. As we are in the midst of a decline of ecological integrity in our province and around the world in general, an act that addresses these issues is perhaps more needed than ever before. We are very pleased to see many important aspects already within the bill, but submit to the committee our recommendations to ensure the best and strongest act is produced in order to meet the intended outcomes. Through our years of experience and research on topics relating to ecology and bio biology, we have settled on the following recommendations, which we would like to see incorporated into the act. The initial state of biodiversity report should be completed as soon as possible. We believe that a two-year period for this initiative is reasonable and that five years with many of our species at risk and precipitous decline is too long to wait. This act requires a strong baseline of comparison and therefore one must be established as soon as possible. After the establishment of the initial state of biodiversity report, we believe that five years for subsequent reports is appropriate. For example, oh, whoops, that's actually a different. Sorry about that. Uh, much of the preamble section should be moved into the purpose section, increasing clarity and weight. Number three, <coughs> excuse me, the addition of the following language. Uh, the minister shall develop goals and targets and objectives for biodiversity conservation by 2021. Number four, the addition of the following language. The minister shall identify critical biodiversity areas and develop an integrated and coordinated biodiversity conservation plan by 2021. Number five, a clarification of the language within clause number 32. No person shall interfere with the lawful and sustainable use of biodiversity by another person. So our concern here is that uh, if this clause were to remain as is, it could be used to crack down on lawful demonstrations and protests. We're just a little bit unclear in terms of the language of that clause. In general, we would like to see a greater emphasis on the balancing, oh, did somebody say a question? No. Nope. Oh, I thought I heard a question. <laughs> In general, we would like to see a greater emphasis on the balancing of social and heritage values that we that are enshrined within our communities across the province as the integrity of biodiversity values are so often inseparable to these values. Uh, for example, the preamble touches on Mi'kmaq values and concepts, which we believe should be in the purpose section. Although there are many clauses that we would want to specifically endorse, uh, so in general, we support and endorse the bill. But uh, no, clause number 45 is of a particular importance to us. We, as it reads, no person affected by this act or the regulation is entitled to compensation for any restriction, encumbrance, or the use, or, or use, or the lack of use of any kind of nature or kind whatsoever that may result or results from the en enactment of this act or the regulations. As biodiversity must be considered a public interest value, it is clear that we all rely upon it for our health, ecosystem services, and the quality of life, as well as those who rely upon its integrity for their livelihoods. For those in the category of the latter, it is essential that adequate regulations are determined in order to ensure the long-term sustainability of both these industries and the biodiversity upon which they depend. Therefore, there should be no expectation of financial compensation from public funding. That's all I have. Thank you. And again, if you don't mind, if I could get the page to make a copy of your presentation for the I've, committee. I have 15 copies. Uh, ready to up. Save the government some money. Thank you. Questions? That's how we balance the budget. No questions from the group? Thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll take your presentation and have that circulated. Thank you. So this moves us ahead uh, further. Is Jamie Simpson here? Jamie, if you're ready and prepared uh, with the Healthy Forest Coalition. So welcome. 
The floor is yours, 10 minutes for a presentation and questions after. Thank you very much and good afternoon, uh, committee members. My name is Jamie Simpson. I'm a lawyer and a forester, and I'm pleased to appear this afternoon on behalf of the Healthy Forest Coalition. The Healthy Forest Coalition is not a registered society, but rather a collection of people from across Nova Scotia who are committed to healthy forests, healthy communities, and sustainable forestry in our province. We support the bill in principle, but urge the department to add substance to the bill. We strongly suggest that too much of the meaningful content of the act is left to the minister's discretion and to regulations to be created, created at an unknown time in the future through an unknown process. The current minister has indicated during the first reading of this bill his dedication to stewardship of our province's biodiversity, but subsequent ministers may not be so inclined. Thus, we recommend changing a few minister may provisions to minister shall provisions. Specifically, section seven should require the minister to undertake the provisions stated in subsections A, B, and H. That is, the minister shall promote the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. The minister shall undertake, promote, or recommend measures to allow for public cooperation in the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. And the minister shall establish or adopt one, goals and targets for biodiversity and indicators of ecosystem health and integrity, <coughs> and two, guidelines, objectives, and standards for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. Left at Minister May, we may well never see these important outcomes of the Act. We urge similar, uh, similar changes for sections uh, 9D and 9H. The minister shall cause studies to be undertaken and cause research to be carried out to section D, establish priorities for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity based on consistent evaluation protocols for biodiversity throughout the province, and H, establish priorities and methods for restoring degraded or impaired biodiversity. With respect to section uh, 14 sub 2, we suggest that the timeline for creating the, the uh, first state of the province's biodiversity be reduced from five years to a year or two at most. Otherwise, this priority risks getting shifted back, uh, getting shifted to a back burner when a new minister or government comes to power. With respect to section 32, no person shall interfere with the lawful and sustainable use of biodiversity by another person. I recommend narrowing this offense to apply only to the uses of biodiversity as enabled under this act or its regulations. Otherwise, this provision could lead to unintended and negative consequences. Finally, we suggest that section 45 is an appropriate and important section. The department is within its rights to regulate the use of biodiversity in the province in, and is under no responsibility to provide compensation with regards to this regulatory responsibility. And that concludes my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. S and again, if we could get copies of that, I understand our photocopiers broke down, but if you could leave uh, copies of that, we'll get Certainly. copies made, please. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. McGuire. Short and sweet, Jamie. That's how we like it, right? Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't, I, we keep hearing may and shall, shall and may. So uh, what's, what's the legal definition and, or difference between may and shall? Right, so may leaves um, the provision up to the discretion of the minister. Um, so it, cr it creates the possibility, but no legal requirement for those pr provisions to be carried out. Um, shall requires the minister to do those things by, by law. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Any further questions? No. Thank you very much Great. for your presentation. Thank Appreciate you for your it. time. And I know on this bill, our last presenter is here, uh, Leif Helmer. Welcome. And just for full disclosure, Leif and I uh, haven't seen each other for 10 years, but did work together previously when I was with the province. So no favoritism will be shown to you on that behalf. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. So as we had heard, uh, 10 minutes for a presentation and five minutes for a question. The floor is yours, Mr. Helmer. Thank you very much. And welcome. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, pleased to be here. Um, I volunteer with the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. So on the agenda, um, it, uh, just in case Research Institute, it's not my own, but uh, that of a 15-year uh, uh, cooperative of uh, landowners, scientists, educators, and uh, researchers working together uh, based in uh, rural Queens County, North Queens, just outside of Kejimkujik. 
And so about 15 years ago, uh, when Gordon and I both still worked for government, um, I uh, was part of the team that helped to uh, found uh, this research institute, and I've maintained that um, uh, collaboration on a voluntary basis. I now teach uh, biodiversity conservation, among other topics, uh, at the Nova Scotia Community College uh, in Bridgewater. So uh, I have a vested interest both for myself, my students, and my children uh, in terms of biodiversity conservation, uh, but I am here as a, a member of the board of directors for the research institute. Um, that said, I'd like to focus on uh, three themes. Uh, there's several things within the, um, uh, the bill that I think are, are promising, and uh, congratulations for bringing it forward in this session. And I think it's um, on, on your shoulders now to bring back amendments that are uh, reflective of what we've heard today. Uh, and I've appreciated many of the comments uh, and agree with much of, of what's been said. I'd like to focus on three R's. Uh, they're different R's than what we're used to. Uh, first, I'd like to look at uh, restoration, uh, research, and reporting. And I think these are three areas that uh, could be significantly improved within the Act. Um, I'll start with restoration. Uh, it's well known that uh, biodiversity is, is under threat. Um, some would say that we're in the sixth extinction. Um, others would consider uh, this a crisis and uh, that we need to not only act to prevent further uh, uh, decline in, in biodiversity of, of species uh, and the richness of species in our province, but also to restore some of those areas that have been lost and to restore some of the lands that have been uh, grievously altered uh, over, over the years. So an example could be our, our salt marsh ecosystems as an example, uh, or a species that has been lost in Nova Scotia, like our caribou, for example. Those are species and ecosystems that have been grievously um, affected and um, could be restored. So the Act is largely silent on restoration. I believe it only appears once in the very uh, back uh, end of the, uh, of, of the legislation, and it's uh, kind of buried under um, other things. Uh, it's one of the regulations that could be brought into, into force. Uh, so restoration would uh, allow an active intervention and management to bring back species or to um, uh, restore ecosystems and habitats that uh, have been degraded. So. My sense is that if it's best in Section 13, it would be an addition uh, to Section 13, uh, maybe subsection 2, uh, to add uh, a priority on the restoration of degraded habitats, ecosystems, and species. Uh, the next uh, area I'd like to move to, uh, the second R, would be uh, research. And uh, while there is some priority placed on research uh, within um, the legislation, I was surprised to see that within Section 15, which is largely about Permit, permits and permitting activities, uh, a research license program is not included. Um, research is really important related to invasive species, related to uh, the status of species, uh, as well as uh, the condition of, of ecosystems, and yet um, there doesn't seem to be uh, a coordinated research uh, effort within the Act. Uh, many other pieces of legislation, including uh, the Wilderness Areas Protection Act, which the Minister of Environment has responsibility for, uh, have a sophisticated research permit system. And you could look no further than that uh, piece of legislation um, to, to borrow language around uh, creating um, uh, even a registry of research permits, uh, or certainly an approval process for research, and to encourage that. And I might go one step further and to say that um, uh, a resource fund or funding, dedicated funding for research, whether it be for invasive species like um, Ms. Kingsbury spoke of, uh, or some of the degraded habitats like I've talked about in restoration, um, if there's a dedicated funding stream for this work, it's more likely to get done. Um, it's hard to find core funding for biodiversity conservation. It's not easy to find. There's not necessarily an economic reason to conserve these species or these, these habitats. And so creating a, um, a revenue stream um, would be very helpful to um, promote and uh, encourage research. And I think that could be uh, in section 15, new edition, it would be subsection four under research license program. And just to pick up on that idea of creating a, a revenue stream, um, you do have penalties associated with the act for different fines, violations, uh, and many of our other um, conservation laws in Nova Scotia turn that revenue around and put it out into the community uh, and, and out into the research community. So um, an example might be uh, a fine from the Wildlife Act, which is then uh, donated or dedicated to um, uh, work that a, a fish and game club would do, or uh, fines from um, uh, 
or sorry, the uh, revenue rather from the uh, hunter education stamp and your, your wildlife um, uh, hunt, hunting license for the year, a portion of that being dedicated to, uh, to fund research in wildlife. So I think that there's a, a revenue stream there within uh, your fines and penalties section that could be turned into a, a research stream for biodiversity. And then the third R is reporting. I think that the Act um, does a couple things with reporting that could be done better. Um, firstly, in Section 14.1, uh, it talks about uh, establishing a mechanism to share data related to biodiversity. And I draw attention to, um, and the members' uh, attention to the Atlantic, Conservation, Atlantic Canada Conservation Data Centre. Um, this is uh, a, a regional organization that does just that, share data related to biodiversity. It exists. It's uh, being used right now by the, all departments, uh, natural resources, sorry, uh, lands and forestry, as well as environment uh, related to endangered species. And it's used by all other provinces in the Atlantic region. There's no need to reinvent the wheel in Section 14.1. I think uh, simply recognizing that uh, we have uh, a, a, good and, uh, a good mechanism already related to biodiversity would be helpful there in, under reporting with the Conservation Data Centre. Um, but the second piece that I might add for reporting is to um, add a public role, and that is the idea of citizen science. In the last few years, I've seen a real boom in a real interest, public interest, uh, emerge in citizen science, and that is your amateur naturalists, uh, birders, anglers, uh, hunters, uh, hikers, people in the woods who are uh, seeing these uh, examples of biodiversity and want to know what that is and report it to somebody and know that that gets tracked and that, that gets uh, monitored. And so we've, at MTRI, at, at the Research Institute, we've sponsored uh, something called a bio blitz, where you bring a bunch of experts and a bunch of the public to an area for a couple of days and you do um, a public engagement around identifying all the species that are there um, and, and recording that. So citizen science builds on that and uh, it, this picks up on the idea of an invasive species network, which was uh, talked about earlier. Um, but under the uh, current bill, uh, as read, um, the reporting really doesn't include anything about uh, citizen science or the opportunity for public engagement within uh, reporting. And so I would add uh, that uh, idea uh, to section 14, uh, subsection three, perhaps. I'd just like to echo the idea that um, uh, a baseline for biodiversity is really important. Five years is too long to release the first uh, of these uh, reports on biodiversity. Every five years after that, perhaps, um, you could be much more bold. Um, you know, my, uh, my junior high daughter will be in university or college by the time uh, the first uh, of those reports come out, comes out. That seems too long for me. And by the time the second one uh, comes out, she'll be a working professional. And that's, that's a decade, and that seems like too long for her generation to wait for good information on the uh, current state of biodiversity and, uh, and the work and actions and progress, hopefully, that um, we have made uh, by that time. So again, I focused on restoration, research, and reporting. And, um, uh, Thank you very much for, for the opportunity to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Helmer. Questions? Ms. Suzanne Lonas-Croft. Um, could I might have missed when you thought the first report should, was that two years or? I think two years would be an appropriate target for the first report. Okay. We've heard that quarter. before today. Yes. Okay, and can I just ask you, you, you meant, used a term, <clears throat> um, citizen science. Yes. Um, that. I take it that's basically amateurs that that do that. What Absolutely. What role do you think they could play in this? Well, we've seen it adopted uh, now at, by various levels. Um, HRM has hosted some uh, events at Point Pleasant Park, for example, to bring uh, a, a mass of amateur um, botanists, birders, and so mm -hmm. forth forward. Um, they can very quickly populate uh, with inventories uh, their observations of what they found that particular um, in, in that particular day or that particular event. Uh, but I think more broadly to some of the woodlot owners, uh, there's a real possibility for woodlot owners to do that, some of that voluntary reporting, what they see on their lands. Um, uh, also see a role for educators and uh, to broaden and encourage young people to be involved in this as well. So we've seen it adopted at Parks Canada. Um, my students were involved in the bio blitz there a couple of years ago, and it's very popular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, if you do have notes that you'd like to leave that we can make copies, I know you sort of ad lib most of that you did, so um, that's fine. I, I won't uh, burden you with my, uh, okay. <coughs> my, my notes here. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Chender. I appreciate your desire not to share those particular notes. I want to thank you for appearing. I sure. think um, you raised some points that we have been hearing, such as the 
um, earlier reporting structure. And also, you weren't the first one to raise the idea. I mean, you did, you called it citizen science, mm -hmm. but that people could report in, that we yep. could have a mechanism where people could be participating in this. Um, but I think your points are important mm -hmm. and ones that we uh, will want to pursue. So sure. if you could find some way to provide them to the committee sure. at a later so. date, I'd, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, if there's an uh, opportunity, I can I can do some uh, <laughs> some clean up, clean up and tidy on that. Sure thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good seeing you again. Should we tell them we're going to redistribute the Okay, I just wanted to notify the committee that the uh, we're going to redistribute the brief that came out for Bill 103. It was missing a page. So uh, that was picked up, so every other page is there, so you'll get that back. Uh, Mr. Rushton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I had the privilege to speak on this uh, second reading, and uh, and I, th I think the whole House was echoed that th this is a good act. Um, we're, uh, we're we're going in the right direction. It's the first of its kind in Canada, and and I made the statement. Let's get this right. We've heard uh, a lot of comments from different sides of the angle uh, today. Uh, many that weren't consulted during the uh, the initial bill writing. And I, I like to move the fact that we uh, move the uh, move that this bill go back to the department for review and uh, and report back to this committee. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor to move the bill back to the house, or I'm sorry, back to the department for further review. Any discussion? Uh, hands up everywhere. Um, Mr. Irvin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the comments. Uh, could I ask for a short recess here to consult my colleagues? Sure. Uh, we'll just take a quick five-minute recess here. We're shorter if we can. So I'll call the meeting back to order. Thank you very much. Um, so there's a motion on the floor to refer the bill back to the department for further discussion. Um, uh, Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and appreciate everybody coming forward today um, and uh, giving their points and their viewpoints on this bill. Uh, I know there was a lot of thought and, and uh, consultation that went into this act. Um, the the truth is is that uh, this is something that we, we're going to need to push forward. Uh, we want to set the trend in Nova Scotia, especially when it comes to biodiversity. There will be other opportunities for whether it's through the um, through through the right or the policy and regulations or before third reading. There's there's another process where we'll stand up in the legislature and debate this. Um, it'll give the minister and the department an opportunity to uh, again speak with stakeholders. But as of right now, we we want to make sure that this piece of legislation uh, moves forward. And if changes are needed, um, then um, I'm sure it will happen. But uh, you know, there there was a commitment for a very diverse. Um, group to create these regulations and policies that hopefully will reflect, reflect not just uh, those that are stewardships of the environment, but for 
uh, individuals that also who are stewardships uh, stewards of the environment, but also make uh, um, a living off this. So it's it's it'll be interesting to see how these regulations and policies play out. But as of right now, we want to make sure that this goes through and it's it's not delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. Mr. LeBlanc, I believe you had your hand up. Sorry. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was going to actually propose a similar motion um, so that we make sure, we've heard from very knowledgeable people in this room today, um, passionate people, but also very knowledgeable people, um, and that the, there are very some, some very simple changes that could be made. The we to, or the shells to the, the maize to the, 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 the shells, um, the, you know, two years for a first report as opposed to five years, some very simple changes that are, that are completely doable. Um, and so, yeah, I was going to, to propose uh, a motion similar. I, I feel like this is a trend with um, our current government, which is to push a bill through and then deal with the problems later. And I think we, it's, we owe it to the people of Nova Scotia. And again, this is an extremely serious um, uh, matter, the biodiversity of our province. And given the, the expertise that we've had in this room today, I feel like we owe it to them, to the experts, but also to every citizen of Nova Scotia to get this right the first time and not have to fix up the problems later. So I'm disappointed to hear that it won't be uh, being adjusted, but I, I am hopeful because I am trying to be hopeful uh, that we will be able to have a fulsome, proper debate on this in third reading and, act and, pause and, and I look forward to maybe even some amendments coming forward by the government at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hallman. Uh, th thank, you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to my colleague's point, uh, those are excellent points and I, I do want to thank those that are here today who to come, that came forward to express your points of view. I think they're very important points of view and uh, I encourage the government uh, to, um, to pay attention to this motion, listen to this motion. Um, we're all agreed that the foundation in this bill is, it's a good bill. Uh, however, we need, to, we need to listen to the concerns expressed here at law amendments. Let's really utilize this committee. What an opportunity. We've heard some very good recommendations that I think the department needs to have a look at. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no reason to rush this. Uh, you have general consent. Uh, among the parties that this is a very good, this is a bill that, that's good for Nova Scotia. However, let's now use this as an opportunity to really listen to what's been expressed here today and, and have the department uh, take those recommendations uh, into consideration and, and, uh, and, and make the necessary changes so that uh, all stakeholders can have, uh, uh, can have agreement on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Chender. Thank you. Um, I would echo some of the comments of my colleagues. Um, I also just want to highlight so uh, uh, a couple things that are new for me at law amendments. Number one, I mean, I commend the minister on this bill. It's a good bill. And I th as my colleagues have said, I think in general, we're broadly supportive of the bill. Um, and so this isn't this isn't the case of the opposition trying to stop a bill from going forward. In fact, we all have an interest in this bill moving forward. Um, but the, the other piece that's interesting about what we've heard today is on more than one point, we heard people um, with vastly different viewpoints agreeing on some changes that could be made. So for one thing, in enforcement, there was you know, a question about whether we wanted to look at whether that um, issue is, whether that um, section is overbroad or not. Um, on the issue of, I don't, I don't think anyone would take issue with this idea that perhaps the first report at least could be in two years rather than in five years. So, I mean, I think there are some simple things and because we also heard from people on, from ver with very diverse viewpoints that they in fact were not mm -hmm. consulted in the way that they expected to be consulted when this bill went through, we don't want to delay. We don't have an interest in delaying. We want this bill to pass in this session. But we know, with basic math around a budget, that we have at least a few more weeks left in this session. And so all we're asking is that the department take a couple of days in lieu of the consultation that did not happen and look at some of these proposed amendments that have come up over and over again and see whether there's some low-hanging fruit there that could be incorporated at this time. So um, certainly, uh, you know, more detailed amendments will come forward at Committee of the Whole, as my colleague said, hopefully some from the government themselves. Uh, but we would support um, our colleague's motion to send the bill back to committee, even just for a couple of days, uh, so that uh, the, some of these amendments can be considered. 
just for clarification, the motion was to send the bill back to oh, sorry, the, back to uh, the department. department. Yeah. Okay, thank I you. No further discussion. So there's a motion on the floor to send the bill back to the department for further consultation. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Aye. Nay. Motion is defeated. Um, Mr. McGuire. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that Bill 106 be referred back to the House without amendments. There's a motion on the floor to send Bill 116, the Biodiversity Act, back to the House without amendments. I think that's what I said. Uh, all, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Contrary minded, nay. Motion's carried. Bill 116, the Biodiversity Act, will be sent back to the House without amendments. Bill 106, the Coastal Protection Act, and we do have, I believe, our presenter here. Thank you for coming early. Appreciate it. Mike Kofal? Kofal? Co as in co-work. Kofal, <laughs> have you, and you have somebody with you. I'll get you to introduce her. Uh, a lawyer with East Coast Environmental Law, Coastal Research. So we have 10 minutes for a presentation and five minutes for questions. And um, I will turn the floor over to you. All right. Thank you for having me and uh, taking the time. Uh, this is Nancy Annixton. Uh, she uh, works with the Ecology Action Center. It's weird hearing myself. And uh, we've been collaborating on the coastal protection file uh, for some time now. Um, we kind of our work began last summer, I think around the same time the government work began. Uh, m myself, I uh, did a uh, uh, jurisdictional scan and research report looking at jurisdictions within Canada and outside of Canada and looking at what they uh, do with coastal protection legislation. And that report was actually submitted uh, to the Department of Environment. So we've been working pretty closely and we've been finding that the consultation process with the Department of Environment on this file has been really good. And I think we're generally pretty pleased to see this uh, coming uh, this soon. And um, I think the work has been really good. And this is a, a bill that I think most, uh, most Nova Scotians are fairly excited about and want to see passed. And I know that our organizations want to see this bill passed. So I commend you on that. So maybe I'll just go right into it. I know you've already spoken, or uh, my colleague and our executive director, Lisa Mitchell, has already spoken on the Biodiversity Act. And so just a quick reminder, uh, East Coast Environmental Law uh, is a organization, a nonprofit legal organization that whose part of their mandate, or our mandate, is to do uh, advocacy and uh, ensure that we introduce fair and effective environmental laws. Um, so saying that, I think to begin with, uh, I'd like to propose just a couple of amendments, the first being that we simply shift around some of the sections. So currently there is a purpose section and a principle section. Uh, the principle section is section 7 and it'll go, obviously that's further down and we'd like to see that moved up uh, just after the purpose section. So that would uh, bring up the principles and immediately make it apparent and clarify the, the, the importance of this act and kind of the overall principles and goals of the act. Uh, the second uh, thing we'd like to see, um, I'd like to refer you maybe to uh, Section 15. And Section 15 deals with um, or permits um, construction of structures, uh, industrial and commercial structures, uh, if, they're required, if they require direct access to the coast. Um, and it's not clear to us how this provision will be opera operationalized. Um, uh, currently, as it stands, it seems to be sort of a double standard. Uh, if a private citizen wants to create a structure on the coast right now, they would require certification by an independent professional. Uh, this is not the case under Section 15 for industrial and commercial structures, and so we'd like to see that uh, added to the section. Um, Additionally, the, the, the phrase or the words industrial and commercial are actually not defined right now in the Act, and so we would recommend that those be defined, because as it stands right now, they're very broad. It's uh, open to interpretation what that might mean, and that can cause problems down the road when you want to actually operationalize and implement this Act and, the, and uh, you know, 
provide um, effective protections for our coast, which are constantly being uh, inundated by climate change and, and coastal erosion and those other sorts of things. Whew. I'm trying to get through this real quick. You've got lots of time. <laughs> Uh, so I'd like to refer you now to section 15B, uh, and you'll see that there's a phrase uh, that allows, that requires the structures to still be consistent wherever possible with the purposes and principles of the Act. And we have just an issue with two little words in there called where, wherever possible. And essentially we think that this makes this piece, this provision unenforceable because it's so broad and it's so open to interpretation of wherever possible might occur that it's unenforceable. So I could give you two quick examples. So if, so if you have um, a commercial or industrial structure that, that someone wants to build and they decide, well, we have a timeline um, and this is not really going to be possible within our internal timeline, so it's not going to be possible. Or uh, we're running kind of into cost constraints, so it's not going to be possible considering the budgets we've already set. I don't think that's uh, appropriate necessarily. Um, I think we'd like to see that all of the structures on our coast um, are consistent with this act and um, that the coast are protected appropriately. Um, and so there is one section in the act that doesn't have this phrase. It has all the rest of that sort of general uh, um, wording. And so section 21, currently, it's, it, it, I, I'm going to quote here, activities undertaken for the purpose of conserving, preserving, restoring, or reclaiming beaches, salt marshes, coastal wetlands, and fish, wildlife, and plant habitat in the coastal protection zone that are authorized under the Beaches Act and the Environment Act must be done in a manner that is consistent with the purpose and principles of this act and compliance with the regulations. And you'll notice that there's no wherever possible in that provision. It's the only one that all of the other ones have that wherever possible. And so we would recommend that it, all of the other sections, and I've identified them in a document that I've sent to the clerk of the committee, and you have it for you, uh, those be amended to omit that phrasing. And finally, because I do have time, um, I'm just going to refer you back to the Section 8 to b which currently allows exemptions for some land not to be uh, included in the Coastal Protection Zone. And we would uh, urge uh, that an amendment be made that'll, um, that th those lands nonetheless be also have to conform with the principles and guiding, uh, the guiding principles and the purposes of the Act so as to provide consistency throughout the pro province with regard to uh, uh, species and habitats and ecosystems. Um, and that would provide consistency. And I think um, that's a good thing. Very uh, good. I think that's everything. So flying through. Thank you. So I, Any questions? Very well written, very well said. No questions? Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. So, Bill 106, Ms. D. Costanzo. Sorry about that. Thank you, Chair. And I move Bill 106, the Coastal Protection Act, back to the House without amendment. Any discussion? All those in favor, the, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motions carried. Bill 106, the Coastal Protection Act, unamended, will be referred back to the House. And that concludes business for our committee today. I thank everybody very much, and we now stand adjourned.